What's unironically supporting the use of methamphetamine? My giant corporate podcast network. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm not even going to. That was great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have no notes. Thank you, Sophie. <laughs> Thank you for taking legal accountability for my actions, as you always no. do in all instances. This is Behind the Bastards podcast. Bad people tell you all about them. Part two of our episode on Hitler, the Nazis. And drugs. So my guest today is Carolina Barlow. Carolina, you are a writer. Uh, you work on the Ron Burgundy podcast with comedy person, William Comedy Farrell. person, mm, comedy William person. Farrell, famously mm-hmm. funny. Mm-hmm. Famously mm-hmm. funny. Providing the um, giggles. Providing the giggles, the chuckles, the yucks. Um, and you also have a weekly podcast. And you also have a weekly uh, podcast. Called True Romance that mm-hmm. comes out every True Thursday. Romance. Light of my life, True Romance. Now, when we talk about True Romance, what about the romance of a young German woman being ordered by her doctor to take methamphetamine so that she can produce more soldiers to go die on the Eastern Front? What about the romance? Is, the, yes. is that is that not the truest romance in a way? So that's not really what we were going for when we mm-hmm. like started our shows much more, you know, so this is Sex not the city references. OK, and stuff OK. Like that. Well, you're, so your podcast is not about fueling the Ostfront's inexorable need for human cattle. You know, we talked about that and we, we were did, like, yeah. let's go mm-hmm. in another direction, actually. It would be a bit late for that at this point, one way or the yeah. other. No matter which side you came in on, it, it, it really Plus, probably— your show is doing that, so it would be We are, we up. are. We yeah. are always trying to convince people to go die in Russia. <laughs> That is, that is, our main sponsor is right. the Bone Fields of Kursk. Um, add your bones to them today. <laughs> what, are, what are you, what are you going to do with them? You're not using your bones. Give them to Kursk. Just anyway, them. yeah. Carolina, you want to talk about Hitler's farts a little bit? Yes. Well, so yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Hitler had a horrible fart problem. And this, this is. Like Trump's a, shit problem. <laughs> like his, the, his enormous shits that couldn't be flushed that he told the entire world about. And everyone was just like, yeah, this is just a thing that's oh happening. Oh, my God. That was <laughs> so good. Fishies in the ocean. <laughs> oh, that was so funny. Not only that, but he literally oh, shits man. his pants all the time. And if you look at close-ups Allegedly. of his pants, he's... I mean, allegedly, what is easier to believe than the fact that Trump shits his pants? I can't. I I mean, the diaper, mm-hmm. the diaper, butt, the Look, big diaper bottom. Lots of rad it. people shit their pants and don't <laughs> do the bad show. things that I the, <laughs> just, just like just babies like ever, shit their pants, babies shit their pants. And most babies do not uh, a- attempt to stop the uh, immigration visas of uh, interpreters. Um, That's true. And and ban immigration from they Muslim really majority can't. nations. That'd be so. Hard it would be for very a baby. hard for a baby to do either baby of those can't things. Even feed himself. Yeah. Even if you were to invest a baby with the powers of the presidency and change the constitution right. to allow a baby to serve, a baby would would have a very difficult time pushing either of those. Even signing its yeah. name would be a tremendous effort. It'll be a whole thing. Uh, I kind of want to see a TV show where you've got like a baby and a bunch of fascists and the baby's the president. So they have to like connive ways to get the baby to like do something recognizable as a signature. They're just having it walk around in ink and stuff. Oh, that'd be a fun show. I think we're giving the, I think this is the next installment of uh, Boss Baby. Mm -hmm. Boss Baby. (laughs) He's he's the he's unknowingly the figurehead of a fascist movement. Uh, exactly. <laughs> it's obvious direction. Uh, damn it! He opened the border. He it. crawled over the wrong paper. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, boss baby. So let's talk about Hitler's farts. Um, this is an important subject because uh, Hitler was one of the most important people who ever lived. Right? Uh, it's that's uh, just kind of objectively. We don't have to think that's a pleasant fact for it to be real. Um, and as a result, the fact that he had a horrible, horrible gastrointestinal problem had an influence on the course of world history. Um, as we talked about last episode, Dr. Morell prescribed Hitler Mutaflor for his GI issues, but he also gave him medication for his out-of-control flatulence, which often led to unbearable gas pain, and in some cases, embarrassing farting during important meetings, sometimes Oof. with like four, like uh, this was a whole thing for Hitler all the way up through his early career. Now, the specific medication that Dr. Morell picked was Dr. Kester's anti-gas pills. 
Hitler's flatulence does seem to have had at least some psychosomatic element. He had particularly bad attacks of cramps and gas during times of stress, meetings with important foreign dignitaries, or the eve of major assaults. So as Hitler went from political brinksmanship to invading all of Europe, his gas attacks grew more frequent and severe, and he had to take more anti-gas pills. Today, there are medications that help with gas, but Dr. Kester's pills were a distinctively quack remedy. Most reputable doctors would not have prescribed them because their active ingredient was Atropa Belladonna, which included atropine and strychnine. So to stop his farts, he was taking strychnine pills every day. That is so gnarly. <laughs> yeah, it's There's a, an you, easier, you, softer way. Yeah, and there, there's debate over there's debate over whether or not it would have been possible for him to take enough of a dose to have hurt because like the the recommended dose of the pills it was too little strychnine to have really done anything. But he was also taking way more than the recommended dose. I I don't know that we have a we also don't have a clear understanding of like how good was that company's the sketchy company's control process. How much do, how, how do we know that he was actually only getting this much or whatever? We do, these are questions that will never be answered. But we do know that he was taking a shitload of strychnine pills for years and, and poison, that that may have had right? an impact. Yes, strychnine is a poison. It's a deadly poison. In high enough doses. Uh, and it can cause severe discomfort and like a, a variety of negative effects. It can also be kind of a sedative in lower doses, although I wouldn't recommend it be because it's strychnine. Um, but yeah, it, again, it's impossible to like say exactly, oh, at this moment, the fact that Hitler was taking strychnine all the time led to this decision. Um, but it is hard to imagine someone taking strychnine in increasing quantities every day for years without there being some kind of impact yeah, on him, right? Something's, in the words of Nancy Myers, something's mm -hmm. got to give, okay? It it's didn't not, help. It's not going to yeah. help. And it, it, again, there is a lot of stuff being shoved into Hitler's body by Morel, these strychnine pills, these weird hormones, these injections, drugs, you know, amphetamines, and we'll talk about the other drugs later. We don't know exactly what did what, but one thing everyone does agree on, and this is universally agreed among scholars and physicians who have reviewed Hitler's records, is that his health declined rapidly after 1941. And it all played a role in that, right? I'm not, it's probably too much to pick one thing. It's stress is also like he's losing a war for most of that time. Sure. So that has an impact too. But I think Russia's probably the, when Russia yeah. comes after you, like it can't feel oh, good. Oh boy, it doesn't feel great, no. Um, now, it is widely agreed uh, that all of Hitler's, like, as I said, so again, we can't say, like, how much of this is on the drugs, how much of this is on aging and stress. But as the war kicked off, Dr. Morell grew a lot more comfortable using Hitler as a guinea pig. And, and you have to assume that has, and we'll talk specifically about that in a bit. So... In August of 1941, Hitler's Operation Barbarossa was well underway, conquering more and more land more quickly and capturing more enemy soldiers than any other invasion force in history. The Wehrmacht had begun to find, find, find itself bogged down, though. Casualties were mounting, and as the winter approached, uh, the Red Army prepared its first of many counterattacks. At this moment, Hitler got sick. For the first time in years, he was too ill to properly work. Dr. Morell was summoned to the German leader's side. He found Hitler bedridden and suffering from diarrhea and fever. The probable diagnosis, with, w diagnosis with, was dysentery. Hitler ordered his doctor to fix him immediately. And again, Morell's main selling point is like, you feel better right away, you know, because I'm shooting you full of caffeine or maybe a meth or whatever. Famously and you will, helps you with will, dysentery. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is the bit of a problem. But like, so a, a dysentery. I've had dysentery. I've had dysentery that nearly killed me in a, 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 a de village in the desert in rural India. Um, there's no quick cure for dysentery. Like your best bet is to take something like Cipro and just kind of like not yeah. die. Yeah, but there, you're not you're not getting better fast. You know, I, I don't even think today we really can. We don't can have a quick shot for no, that. No, yeah. not not once it gets going. Maybe if you're super rich and you get immediately to the, I, I don't know. Maybe there's something. Walter like, Reed. <laughs> yeah, it's not immediately available, and especially at this point, there, there's nothing Morel can do for Hitler really. Um, so he tries though. Um, so because uh, his first shot was like vitamins, he's basically giving him a shitload of vitamin C and other vitamins to try to like 
perk of his immune system, and obviously this doesn't do anything. And so Morel decided next to mix his normal vitamin shot with a steroid, glyconorm, which he made with extracts of the heart, adrenal glands, liver, and pancreas of farm animals. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. He's shooting Hitler up with a lot of random animal hormones. Like, there's a whole, for, for years, it's pretty cool. This seems so what, to have, like, the ambition of Dr. Frankenstein a little bit. Yeah, there's some, again, hormones are also kind of new in terms of like our understanding of them, like vitamins. So people are just like, yeah, just fill people up with hormones. Seems like a good idea. <laughs> it's fun stuff. So while he was juicing Der Fuhrer up, Morell bent his needle in Hitler's arm. And to deal with the pain of that, he gave his boss Dolantin, an opioid. Despite yes. all of this, Hitler was still sick and now enraged that his personal physician had failed. Morell wrote in his notes, Fuhrer, very irritable, have never experienced such hostility to myself. He might not be such a cool guy. Well, and again, Hitler loves Merrill up to this point because Merrill's right. dr his drug dealer, whether the shot's just caffeine or if there's amphetamine or like or hormones, which are powerfully mentally active. He's he's he's, he's Dr. Feelgood. Yeah. Yeah. He's Dr. Feelgood. And he and it always works because drugs do work. That is the fun thing about drugs. If you take a drug, you may have to take more and more, but you will continue to get high. It's kind of the thing the drugs do. Um, whereas everyone else in Hitler's world at some point fails, generally repeatedly fails. And so he has all these rages at people who don't do good enough for him. But Morell always comes in and makes him feel good. And when he doesn't, it's, you know, most people don't like their drug dealers at the best of times. I don't know. Maybe it's different now for you kids and your, your pot shops and stuff. But my day, <laughs> if you wanted to buy drugs, you had to hang out with a dude you probably wouldn't have hung out with if you were not buying drugs from them. Um, not all. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely had some cool ass drug dealers, too. But like, yeah, America some videos. Yeah, yeah you're going to sit around talking about Alex Jones with a guy before he sells you a bag <laughs> of weed and some opium. Um, and that's not going to be the funnest experience of your entire life. Um, sorry to my cool drug dealers that I had in the yeah, past. Yeah, any but, of my old drug know. dealers are listening. It's not you. It's it's the game. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, the institution. It's, it's the game, and it's the fact that you made me listen to Alex Jones a bunch while you were measuring out. Anyway, whatever. And the um, so really cute guy I saw in my drug dealer's house in two thousand and nine. Mm -hmm. I thought we shared a moment. If you're out there, maybe this is too late for a misconnection on Craigslist, but thinking of you. I did date a couple of my drug dealers, and I do recommend that. Yeah, okay. You, you get cheap drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you get very expensive drugs, depending on how you measure expense. Yeah. Like on an emotional level, they can be very, very yeah. pricey. Most expensive weed you ever buy sometimes. <laughs> but this, anyway, this got dark really you know, fast. This got dark really fast. Time is money. I don't want to <laughs> spend that much time with um, people who yeah. are, will laugh at anything. I don't know. Drugs. Anyway, so Morel, Hitler's drug dealer, has just like, you know, failed to come up with the shit for the first time. And Hitler doesn't want to hang around and listen to Alex Jones if he's not going to get a dime bag, you know? Um, and Morel's like, don't text him out. <laughs> <laughs> signal, bro. You got to hit me up on signal. <laughs> um, so eventually Hitler did recover from the dysentery. But the fact that his normally instant injections had not provided quick relief rattled Dr. Morel. His ability to get and stay rich was directly tied to Hitler's favor. And Hitler, as you may not, as you may be surprised to learn, kind of a fickle dude. <laughs> kind of, kind of easy to fall out of Hitler's favor. Yeah, not reliable. Um, see, the night of long knives. And so, as Norman Oler writes in Blitz, quote, so that patient A didn't end up in the sick bay again and fall behind, Morell administered a harder course of prophylactic injections and went on to prescribe more and more remedies in ever-changing concentrations. He barely made any diagnoses, but instead constantly added to his basic medicinal treatment. This soon included such diverse substances as tonophosphan, a metabolic stimulant made by the company Hetched, chiefly used nowadays in veterinary medicine, the hormone-rich and immune system-boosting bodybuilding supplement homocerin, a byproduct of uterine blood, the sexual hormone testoviron to combat declining libido and vitality, and orchicrin, a derivative of bull's testicles, which is supposed to be a cure for depression. Another and substance all of these happen to be our sponsors. <laughs> yeah, we are heavily <laughs> sponsored by orchicrin. <laughs> 
<laughs> you feeling sad? Don't go to therapy. Get a bull's testicles <laughs> injected testicles. into your bloodstream. And I've got some stuff for my uterine blood for anyone who is mm-hmm. interested. Mm-hmm. There you go. That'll be a cure for your... What was that a cure for? Um, <laughs> libido and virality. There you go. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, sorry. That was a bodybuilding. It'll it'll oh. get, you, get you buff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure will. It's been working to help me pump iron. Mm-hmm. That's, uh, it, it is iron rich. Um, which is why, uh, people, ladies often need to take iron pills. Um, (laughs) so another substance used was called prostacrinum, um, which was made by, from seminal vesicles and the prostates of young bulls. Even though he didn't eat meat, Hitler surely could no longer be considered vegetarian. From autumn 1941 onward, more and more highly concentrated animal substances began to circulate in his bloodstream. The purpose of these supplements was to compensate for states of psychological and physical exhaustion or to prevent them in advance by reinforcing the body's defenses. However, as a result of the constantly changing applications and the rising doses that followed, Hitler's natural immune system was soon replaced by an artificial protective shield. Now, I don't know how scientifically accurate that last bit is, but he's definitely on point about, like, what Hitler was taking. And my God, it's, again, uh, we don't know, like, what exact impact, but it can't have, it has to have influenced the, he's getting so much shit shot into his bloodstream. Ridiculous stuff. Two different kinds of bull testicles shot into uh, his blood. A couple different kinds of animals. Like, like a lot of animals shot into him. <laughs> a lot of animal hormones. Like it's, of course this has an influence on the guy's thinking. Like it would and not. Yeah. To think we've just outed him as not vegetarian. It feels mm-hmm. like now he could really get canceled. Mm-hmm. Like these little, you know, pockets cancel of culture finally has. comes for we Hitler. Can, we really just need to get them this information mm-hmm. and see how they really feel. There's some guy with 1488 tattooed on his forehead hearing this and just starts weeping, weeping. like sadly tears <laughs> down his Hitler poster. <laughs> I'll never believe in anything again. <laughs> So oh. one of the shortcomings of Blitz, and I don't even know if this would have been possible, but it is it is a, a missing thing, is that Oler doesn't give us a lot of scientific information about how all these weird animal derivative substances would have impacted Hitler's body and mind. And in fairness, there's probably not a lot of great data on this stuff because no one else would have used it, or at least would have used it to the extent that Morel did. So we don't have I mean, the guinea pig anymore. Yeah, Hitler was the guinea pig. So it's like it is. Uh, this is a missing aspect of the book. I don't know that it's fair to critique Oler for it because, like, yeah, I don't know how many other people got this much bull testicle injected into their bodies, like, or this much well, like uterine blood extract. I have a friend. <laughs> you have friend. How's he doing? Has he invaded Russia recently? Um, he's thinking about it. <laughs> he's thinking about it. Well. Yeah. There he, he, he says it's just the bull testicle talking. Mm-hmm. Well, we, we get one more person, and then then we have a and trend. We, we have can, maybe, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we so, have a study. Yeah. Um, Hitler loved all this stuff, though. Like, again, whatever we could say about the absolute effects, we just don't have a lot of data. Hitler seemed to feel like it had a big impact on him. He, he was mentally dependent on this stuff. So, again... I, some of it's probably purely psychosomatic, right? Like he has a couple of good experiences early on with Morel and he becomes kind of, it's almost like a good luck charm before a big meeting, I need to get shot up. Maybe most of it's like the caffeine as opposed, but like, I don't know how much of it is is what, but he's profoundly mentally dependent on this stuff to the point that, at, you know, late in the war when Hitler is, when von Stauffenberg tries to blow him up with a bomb, after that point, everyone who was close to Hitler gets thoroughly searched by the SS the only person exempt was Dr. Morell in his medical bag, which is th- wow. gives you an idea of like how important this guy was to Hitler. Later that year, Hitler and Mussolini took a train ride together to the Eastern Front. It was Boys a 24- trip. Boys trip, right? You want to be on that train? <laughs> Hitler and Mussolini pounding shots, injecting like bull testicles into their thick, together. weird necks. Yeah. But like all we talk about is work. We just have Bro, to get together. Bro, I feel like. In the early days, man, we would be like hanging out, you know, annexing shit all the time. Yeah. Like, what's up, man? You invade Russia and you don't have any fucking time for me. Exactly. You know, it's 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 like that for them. So it's a 24 hour trip, and obviously Hitler full like, of farts. So many farts. <laughs> on that full train. of farts. Yeah, not a, you do not want to be in that train. Um, all, Mussolini probably too, right? You look at that guy's <laughs> fucking face. That's a guy who's you don't want to be in a train with. Um, but also. <laughs> 
Hitler can't stand that long without getting shot up, right? He's again, he's very dependent on whatever the fuck Morel is putting into his veins. Um, and so periodically, the SS would stop the train and set up anti aircraft defenses so that Dr. Morel could shoot Adolf Hitler up with veterinary steroids and calcium. <laughs> I can imagine Mussolini being like the one time Mussolini mm-hmm. was like, I don't know. And I don't like, know about this, guys. I try this. No, it's like amazing. It's like Kundalini yeah. yoga. Like it, it really sets me right. I mean, that is the, um, the story of Mussolini. Cause Mussolini is a lot of ways, a much more stable man than Hitler ever was. And a lot less of a true believer. Again, Mussolini is a guy of flexible political idea. He really just kind of wants power. Um, and there's part of the Mussolini story is like kind of belatedly realizing like, oh, shit, I should not have gotten involved. This allying with Germany seemed like a good call at a certain point. I did not want all the trouble this is bringing my way. I did not want war with all of these other countries. Like, why did I do this? And yeah, I'm sure this train is Hitler's getting shot up with veterinary steroids and farting. Mussolini's like, ah, oh, God damn it. Uh, uh, I mean, you know what? <laughs> this might be on me a little bit. <laughs> like, you're my only friend. Mm-hmm. Like, I chose Ugh. you. This is not an inspiring situation. I have a feeling I'm going to get hung upside down by my own people. Yeah. <laughs> Beaten as like a pinata. Um, he texts Winston Churchill and he's just like, like hey. Hey. You know why? I just wanted to say what's up. You know, I've been missing you lately. <laughs> I know there's been like a lot of shit, but I yeah. think like we can maybe just talk. You want to talk? You want to have like a... <laughs> No, Hitler, I'm not talking to anybody. Shut yeah, up. Like, exactly. Stop it. Go go take more veterinary steroids. Come You're on. Growing a tail. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the exact nature of what Hitler took did change every day. Morel kept a rotating stable of eventually more than 80 different hormone preparations mixed with steroids, nonsense medicine like anti-gas pills, traditional medicines, and drugs and like amphetamines and shit. And we'll talk about other stuff that was in there later. Oler alleges that there was a psychological importance behind the fact that Hitler's drug diet changed daily. It meant he avoided feeling dependent on any specific drug, but was instead dependent on Dr. Morell's overall care. This is impossible to prove in like an objective way, but it, it makes sense. It's a logical leap, but it's one that I don't think is an implausible one. It makes like... If I were doping Hitler, I would have done the same thing, right? Just knowing what I do about drugs is like, yeah, you don't want him to get too dependent on any one thing. Also, it won't work as well if they get too dependent. So like, okay, we'll do the opiates and then we'll take a couple of days and we'll give you you some caffeine the next day or we'll give you a little bit of like speed the next day. And then, you know, you kind of, you cycle, right? Like that's the, that's, that's, that's the, the best way to do this if you're doing it. I think, I I think Oler's leap there is, is a, a pretty intelligent one. Now, while the Fuhrer was growing ever more dependent on a bizarre cocktail of steroids and hormone extractions, the Wehrmacht itself dealt with the whole sweep of drug addiction. If you've never been a functional addict, by which I mean someone who relies on a specific drug as a performance enhancer to help them in a task, there's other things people will call as a functional addict. In this sense, I'm saying like, you're somebody who does a thing and you rely on a drug to help you do that thing. So like Lance Armstrong. is Yes, like Lance Armstrong. Or like a certain podcaster who may or may not be talking right now. Let me give you an overview of how it works. First, you're introduced to a new drug that hits just right. And my God, it's like falling in love when you discover a new substance that tickles your brain specifically in a perfect way. It's one of the best feelings in the world. The problem is, like new relationship energy, it does not last. Um, So first thing, you fall in love, you discover that all these situations in which this drug helps you and makes things better, makes life easier, but gradually your body gets used to it. It's stops hitting as hard. Sometimes the way that it changes works, right? Like I haven't smoked pot in years. I used to for I smoke pot every waking hour of every day. And I have not in years because it, at some point, probably as a result of the PTSD, it stopped. Like I, I smoked it to work. I worked the whole early part of my career was built on it. Um, again, it's been a long time, long, long, long time since I've smoked pot. But like when I did, it was, um, it was necessary. And then at a certain point I wasn't able to work on it. So like that, and that happens with a lot of different substances. It can happen with everything, which is why you shouldn't do anything every single day. Um, but that is you kind of the do way anything period. No, you should I mean, do like, lots of stuff. Huh? <laughs> no, I mean like people should do less in general. Oh yeah. Like, oh, like work. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, like, yeah. Just, like, like do less is my advice. 
Less work, more drugs, but don't yeah. switch them up, you know? Yeah. Take acid one day, you know, then you take a little bit of oxy, then maybe you get right. drunk the next night, then you smoke a bone the next day, and you kind of cycle through it like that, and then you're basically sober because you don't get addicted to any one drug. Nothing touches you anymore. Perfectly medically sound advice right this, there from this Robert Evans. feels like you're winding up to an ad break, which you should be. Speaking of doing a lot of drugs, you know what drugs... You should do the ultimate high, the only real high, capitalism. Because, baby, <laughs> spending money on products and services, that's a high you never get over. You want more, that more shit, and more. Mm, absolutely, and there's no consequences whatsoever. No one would ever claim that, for example, our addiction to consumption and endless growth is in a lot of ways very similar to how an opiate addiction works, where you require greater and greater doses to have the same effect. And eventually that can lead you to making miscalculations that kills you, or in the case of a society, making miscalculations about what is actually necessary that leads to the death of the entire planet. It's not like that at all. Here's some ads. We're back. Oh, so we just talked about Hitler a bunch. We're going to talk about Hitler some more, but let's talk about the Wehrmacht. How do you feel about the Wehrmacht, Carolina? You a big Wehrmacht stan? Um, yeah, you know, me and my family, that's not really like our story, but I'm curious <laughs> on um, like how you feel. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a German military history nerd. I find it fascinating. Um, right. And one of the problems when you're a German military history nerd is that half of German military history nerds are cool people who are interested for very good reasons, because like all modern military tactics are based off of the shit that the German imperial military and then the Wehrmacht pioneered. Um, and then there's Nazis. That's the other half of people right, who are really right, into right, that right, stuff. Right. Yeah. It's um, sort of like, um, when you see people collect World War II memorabilia. Yes. It gets, there's a real yeah, lucky there's, line. There's a line there. There's oh, it seems like you're only collecting one side. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, yeah. But again, I mean, and obviously, I, I I study the Wehrmacht, and part of what I study about the Wehrmacht is the the outrageous amount of war crimes they committed that were out of proportion to to really any other actor in that war. Um, you can make some out. I mean, on a per capita basis, certainly out of out of because like the the Red Army and the U.S. Army have plenty of tro atrocities they carry out in World War II. But on a in terms of a the amount of soldiers directly involved in crimes against humanity to the Wehrmacht stand, well, not alone because the Japanese army exists, but stands in pretty right. rarefied air, you know? Um, and um, a big part of Wehrmacht culture was taking a shitload of meth. Mm. So, yeah, it, I, I just walked through a little bit about like what it's like to be kind of a functional user of a drug, right? Um, and if you are kind of using a drug to function, it will eventually stop hitting as hard. And the best way to handle that is to take a break from it, right? If you find yourself just for coffee, right? I'm going to guess most people listening to this are kind of a functional addict of coffee or at least of caffeine. Yes. Most people in America. Yeah, so do I. If you find yourself being like, Jesus, I actually, I'm not feeling good. I'm taking way too much of this stuff. Like, I'm, it, it's not making me feel good. One of the best things you could do is take a few weeks off, you know, let your tolerance reset so you don't need as much. Um, and then try to restart and get by at a lower dose with like a kind of a more moderate use of, you know, that's not easy, but it's, it, it is the good idea to do if you like are concerned about your level of consumption of a substance. So that's the way it works for everybody and, and kind of with every substance, any substance that you would be using on a daily basis. The only, and that's a, a doable thing. It's not easy, but it's doable. Now, the problem is, if you were, say, using methamphetamine to help you fight for days without sleeping in order to conquer Europe, you might find the process of adaptation of taking a couple weeks off a lot more difficult because you're in the middle of a war zone, you know? It's kind of a bad place to, like, deal with coming off of a substance. Um, and this is the situation the Nazis eventually found themselves in. Um, and I'm going to quote from time here. The invasion of Poland in September 1939 served as the first real military test of the drug in the field. Germany overran its eastern neighbor by October, with 100,000 Polish soldiers killed in the attack. The invasion introduced a new form of industrialized warfare, Blitzkrieg. This lightning war emphasized speed and surprise, catching the enemy off guard by the unprecedented quickness of the mechanized attack in advance. The weak link in the Blitzkrieg strategy was the soldiers, who were humans, rather than, of course, 
machines, and as such suffered from fatigue. They required regular rest and sleep, which of course slowed down the military progress. That is where Pervitin came in. Part of the speed of the Blitzkrieg literally came from speed. As medical historian Peter Steinkamp put it, Blitzkrieg was guided by methamphetamine, if not to say that Blitzkrieg was founded on methamphetamine. Now, meth being meth, soldiers quickly began reporting side effects. There were heart attacks and other problems in the field. The consequences, though, were not nearly severe enough to outweigh the value meth provided. But Reich health Fuhrer Leo Conti did grow worried about the long-term impact of such drug abuse upon the flower of German man. And he's like, all of our young men are taking meth all of the time. This might not be good <laughs> for our I like health. That he's also like, listen, they're doing a lot of other stuff too, but like, mm. I don't want this to like ruin their futures. I don't want this to ruin. Yeah, as they're as they're rounding up Jewish people and committing exactly. mass murders, like, oh, I don't yeah. want this to hurt their ability to get a job like, someday. Are they going to be okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and it, obviously, at this point in time, most of the atrocities the Nazis would commit had not yet been committed. Um, but they're getting it started. They do a lot in Poland. They do a lot of atrocities in Poland. And they're on meth for those atrocities, which is not to say that they're committing those atrocities because of meth, but meth does make it a lot easier to commit atrocities. If you want if you want to get a lot of people to commit atrocities without sleeping for several days, methamphetamine's really your best bet, you know? Or brown round. Oh, we could do some brown round and record a podcast, Sophie. Can we no. Some, can, we, can we can we can we can we please? Listen. No. It's not going to help you record a podcast, but it's going to make it a lot easier to record a podcast. Yeah, Sophie. I've got no. all the gunpowder. All we need is the cocaine. You're in L.A. No. You can get it. OK, well, all right, fine. Yeah, they do sell it on every street corner here. Yeah. So Leo Conti grows concerned about the long term impact of meth abuse on health of German people. Uh, in late 1939 and 19, early 1940, as Germany prepared to invade France, he pushed for new regulations that ensured Provitin was only available to citizens by prescription. So he makes it not over the counter anymore for citizens. Now, again, soldiers are still getting issued this. And of course, the German people largely ignored this dictate. You could find a doctor who could get it to you. Uh, factory workers, doctors, nurses, government bureaucrats, everybody was on it. You're like, point. I have the glaucoma. Yeah, I have got coma. Give me my fucking meth. Uh, Timmler massively surged their production, expanding to make more than 833,000 tablets per day. Most soldiers received pills. During the invasion of France, German servicemen dispensed more than 35 million meth pills. That's, um, that's a good amount of meth. That's like that's like two and a half Walter White's worth of methamphetamine, yeah. you know. Um, it was also handed out in chocolate bars for pilots uh, and in for tank drivers. You had pilots. Yeah, you had Flieger chocolade and Panzer chocolade. So you had like mm. tank chocolate and, and fighter pilot chocolate. Um, awesome. And these were a little bit more mellow. You didn't want it as kind of like ha ha like hardcore a, a, a hit uh, as you got with the pills if you were like piloting a vehicle. Um, oh, oh, that makes sense. Cool, mm -hmm. cool, cool. Yeah, I mean, you, you, that's not that's my, you know my motto, Sophie. Only take half as much meth if you're going to be piloting an aircraft. <laughs> yeah, you do say that often. It's good advice. It's good advice. Um, I like the idea of a pilot announcing himself to all his passengers <laughs> and being like, "And you guys, yeah. I have some chocolate for this trip. I, I got, so, I got, some, I got a I got me a chocolate bar, y'all. Hold on to your fucking." Um, Hats. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be rad. Um, so uh, that said, so again, everyone was using it, but it's primary use. And the people taking the most meth were the infantry, the people marching. Most of the German military advanced on foot for all the like for all of the um, the attention the Blitzkrieg gets. Most of their soldiers are not in vehicles. Most of them don't even have horses. Most of them are fucking walking. Um, and there's a lot of walking to do. And so they take a fuckload of meth to allow them to walk for days. And then after you've walked for two days straight, you might need to get into a gunfight. So you want to be alert. So you want to take a fuckload of meth. Uh, historian Shelby Stanton writes, quote, They dispensed it to the line troops. 90% of their army had to march on foot day and night. It was more important for them to keep punching during the Blitzkrieg than to get a good night's sleep. The whole damn army was hopped up. It was one of the secrets of Blitzkrieg. When German tanks rolled around the Maginot Line and began the mass encirclement of the French army, a few key factors made their stunning victory possible. On an organizational level, this was the concept of Auftragstaktik. This German military concept vested an extreme degree of personal autonomy in unit commanders. In other words, officers weren't expected to follow orders and move their men into position. They were basically, instead of being said, okay, I want you to do this and that, I want you to move your men here and take this objective, then move here and take this, they were said, I need you to be in this location on or before this time. 
and kind of up to you to figure out like how to get your men there and whatnot. So you have as like a, a, a company commander, what you have a lot of, of discretion. And for young tank officers like Erwin Rommel, this meant driving for days ahead of the German army. They were competing with all the other units. And so they weren't like, they weren't being told be here at this point. Be, they were told like, basically go as far as get you fucking here. can. <laughs> yeah. And they were, and they were trying to beat each other too. And they were, they were advancing with a greater speed than any army had ever advanced because number one, for the first time, these small units are kind of empowered to like, if you can go further, go further. Don't wait for approval to advance again. Just fucking do it if you think you can make it. And also they're on a shitload of methamphetamine. And so it's this mix of macho pride, right? They're competing with each other to see who can go the furthest fastest. Um, and also, fucking meth, um, which synergize together really well. Uh, if you've ever seen a bunch of uh, real dudes hopped up on meth, dudes hopped up on meth, like that's the Wehrmacht. Um, and right. they advance further and faster than any army ever had in the history of warfare. And this attitude seized the Wehrmacht from the top down. General Heinz Guderian, leader of the invasion, told his tank drivers, I demand that you go sleepless for at least three nights if that should be necessary. And again, there's no way to do that functionally without a fuckload of speed. You know, you're not you're not right. going to be able to functionally operate armored vehicles for three straight nights in a row if you're not taking something, right? U.S. soldiers, it was ephedrine and uh, and rip fuel and shit, but like it was still something. You need something. Um, there were, of course, consequences to all this rampant meth abuse from time. Quote. Some users report negative side effects of the drug. During the French invasion, these included a lieutenant colonel with the Panzer Airsats Division 1, who experienced heart pains after taking preventin four times daily for as many weeks. The commander of the 12th Tank Division, who rushed to a military hospital due to the heart attack he suffered an hour after taking one pill, and several officers who suffered heart attacks while off-duty after taking preventin. A decent number of officers died from this stuff. Conti continued, the Reich health officer, continued to warn other high-ranking Nazis that there was a serious danger to the Volk's health. In early 1941, German newspapers quoted the BBC, who credited the Blitzkrieg's success to meth pills. They'd captured Luftwaffe pilots over Berlin with preventin in their emergency bags. Stories spread from occupied France of German soldiers taking meth before visiting brothels and handing out love pills to the girls. Later really? that year, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nazis, I mean, France is famous for its brothels and Nazis are famous for their meth. Two great things that grow great together. It would suck to get roofied and it would suck to get roofied with meth. Yeah, I don't know if they're being roofy because meth is incredibly popular at this point. It's, it, a lot of them are probably just being like, hey, you want to take some meth with me and fuck? And That's yeah. true. I guess if they're yeah. literally getting offered quote unquote love pills, it's just yeah. uh, um, it's because they're not a blacking a out. Date. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're getting paid, too. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a whole thing. Of all of the things the Nazis do that are immoral, paying sex workers is, 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 it doesn't really it's hit the casual, list for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, that said, I mean, obviously, I'm sure, I don't know. Who, who knows how many times they, like, trick people into eating pans or chocolate that don't know that there's meth in it, right? Because they want to get the girl hopped. I'm sure that happens. I'm sure some sure. of them get dosed without consenting because they're Nazis. Also, they're men like they're they're young men in a like for anyway it's it's just shit that you know it's hap it's common with every single military does versions of this uh, throughout history and the nazis are just the first ones who have access to meth by the summer of 1941 while the wehrmacht prepared for operation barbarossa conti succeeded in pushing an amendment to the opium law that heavily restricted preventant from german citizens the military was exempted from this of course the wehrmacht had to blitz another krieg and they weren't going to do it sober the use of preventant during the Russian invasion is not well documented. This is because the records the Nazis kept of that period were largely lost or destroyed when the war went pear-shaped for them. The official journal of German military physician publish, physicians published articles in 1942 and 1943 that included letters from medical officers reporting that they had been ordered to do dose their soldiers with preventant. The best information we have suggests that it was just as common as it had been in France. In fact, military doctors found new uses for the drug. They mixed it with morphine, creating crude speedballs in order to increase the analgesic effect on wounded soldiers. You got shot. Give him some meth and opium. Like, give him a At fucking point, speedball. It's just like a frat making jungle juice. It's like, pour yeah, everything yeah. you have in your pockets into yeah. this pail. Take it all. Fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the Wehrmacht stuff was transported on horseback, and the army found that giving horses meth allowed them to work a lot harder and faster. 
<laughs> so they're messing up the horses. Why am I annoyed by this so much? Mm-hmm. It's like you said, they're doing like so much worse shit. But I'm like, yeah. can you just leave the horses out of it? Why are you giving meth to the horses, guys? Well, hey, guys, come guys, on. Guys, Nazis. <laughs> It's like you guys are really, really living up to the name right now. Yeah. I feel like y'all might not have everyone's best interests at heart. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, now, again, so they find a lot of new uses, and especially in the early days, because the German, the advances in early Barbarossa are just uh, uh, unprecedented. I think still unequaled in the history of warfare in terms of, like, the length of time, the number of... There's there's single battles where they take 600,000 prisoners, like, in a day or, like, or so of fighting. Like, they, they've got... They've encircled and just captured... Like the population of Portland, Oregon, like it's this massive, massive. And part of how it's possible is they don't have to sleep for days because they're on a fuckload of meth. Now, if you've never taken stimulants for days in order to drive or otherwise travel long distances, I'll explain how it works. The first two or three days are great. If you're young and healthy, you can just take a nap after like 48, 72 hours, then go hard for like another 48 hours, and you're going to suffer minimal consequences. I say minimal, uh, but what I mean is that the damage you're doing to your body and mind won't be immediately obvious, especially since listening to Alex Jones while pounding Benzedrine and dive, driving through the desert can be a lot of fun when you're allegedly 19. Now, after a few days, less if you're older, the speed stops working as well. You may still be awake technically, but you won't be alert. You'll be jittery. You'll start to hallucinate. You'll suffer heart palpitations. You may not want to eat, which will will of course make you crash even harder when the crash comes. If you've been driving a bunch of mushrooms across the Southwest, that's not such a big deal because after you drive a couple of days, you can stop and crash for 16 hours in your friend's futon and you'll be fine. German soldiers during Barbarossa didn't have a friend's futon to crash on, and they weren't finishing up after a couple of days. Again, they would they have conquered loved Alex Jones, though. They would have. They would have liked Alex Jones. I mean, not early Alex Jones as much, right. but certainly today Alex Jones. Yeah. Um, so. German soldiers during Barbarossa, again, they'd conquered more territory more quickly than any army ever. All these tank units were covering hundreds of miles in a space of days. The problem with Russia, though, is that it's very big. There's, there's quite a lot of Russia. And the Russians just kept retreating. <laughs> in France, a few days of friends of, like, they could, they could go, let's, let's, none of us sleep for like five days and we'll drive the whole time and we'll have conquered most of France and, like, you know, we'll be well on our way to winning this war. Um, Russia didn't work that way because there was so much of it left. So by the time they reached <laughs> the point where it's like, well, we, even on meth, we can't keep taking meth and not sleeping. We're all crashing. We're not functional. We're hallucinating. We have to stop and rest. Well, that point hit where they're still in the fucking middle of Russia and surrounded by enemies who have not collapsed the way the French did, which is a bad situation to be in, right? Meth turns out to maybe not be the best way to conquer Russia. Um, Whereas it apparently is a pretty good way. If you're you're trying to conquer France, historically, meth could help. I wouldn't recommend it if you're trying to conquer Russia. And a really bad (laughs) hangover is being in the middle of Russia yeah, <laughs> attacked by, by Red Army partisans. Yeah, off of meth. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, you do not want to be coming down from three a three day meth bender under heavy fire. <laughs> it's very much like looks to camera. I wonder, mm. like, yeah. you want to know how I ended up here? <laughs> Bet you're wondering why I ended up here, and it's just a montage of somebody taking a bunch of meth pills, driving yeah. a tank real and, fast, and, you know, like World War Two. Yeah. Yeah. So after the first several weeks of Barbarossa, they had no time to recover, and they hadn't won a victory. German soldiers at the wrong end of a meth bender found themselves exhausted, sick, and surrounded by an enemy just waiting to counteract a bunch of racked-ass infantry whose eyesight was probably 80% hallucinations. Norman Oler quotes one German military doctor at the time who wrote, I didn't take Previtin myself, or at least not often, just once to try it, to know what I was prescribing. I can tell you it worked. It kept you awake mercilessly. We knew it was addictive and that it had health side effects, psychoses, nervous excitement, a loss of strength. And in Russia, it was a war of attrition, positional warfare. In such circumstances, Previtin was no use. It just exhausted you. You eventually had to catch up on the rest you'd missed. Sleep deprivation simply didn't bring any tactical advantages anymore. So they just reached the point where, this is again, something that people who get addicted always learn, the shit that used to work don't work no more. That's how fucking meth works for the Nazis in Russia. It goes great in Poland and France, and then suddenly the worm, you know, worms turned. Now, 
In late 1941, the Russians counterattacked. The Wehrmacht held, but they suffered severe casualties. And more importantly, the fact that the Red Army had failed to collapse and in fact been able to counterattack punctured the myth of German invulnerability. Then came the Russian winter, which the Germans were not prepared for. I'm and not going to read. Were like Merry Christmas, <laughs> Merry Christmas, motherfuckers. This is our lives. <laughs> These are our holidays. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm not going to relitigate the whole lost frontier, but you know the gist of the story. The Russians used their basically limitless, limitless manpower reserves to hurl attack after attack against the Germans, eventually breaking through their lines and encircling several armies. It was only when the tide turned against Germany that Preventen became useful again. From Blitzed. Often the only thing that helped was Preventen, one of many examples in the fishing village of Vizvad on the southern shore of Lake uh, Lemon between Moscow and Leningrad, the Germans were encircled, their lodgings set on fire, rations arriving only sporadically from the ice-cold air. One last tiny window of escape was open, and 500 exhausted men loaded with heavy bags and machine guns over their shoulders began a 14-hour night march through waist-deep snow. Soon many men were, as the official Wehrmacht report has it, in a state of extreme exhaustion. The snowfall had stopped from around midnight and the sky was filled with stars. Innervated soldiers wanted to lie down in the snow. In spite of energetic pep talks, their willpower could not be revived. Such men were each given two pervitin tablets. After one, after half an hour, the first men confirmed they felt better. So again, if you're trying to retreat across Russia and need to be able to march after not sleeping through the snow in the dark, meth might help again. But by that point, you know, the war had gone against them. But you know what never goes against you? I'm trying to think what you're coming up with here because it can't be capitalism. It's it, it's the products and services that support this podcast. Always, they, they always have your back. Always, mm. always. Allegedly. Mm. Allegedly. Allegedly. All right, here's the ads. Oh, we're back. All right, so... We had some fun with the Wehrmacht. Um, I, I want to, I'll tell one last story about it. This is about the German Navy. So very late in the war, like I think 44, 45, uh, the German, you know, their Navy's not doing great. Nothing's really doing great for the Germans. And they decide their best idea is to create these suicide boats. They're basically torpedoes piloted by a man that he can suicide bomb a, 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 um, a, a warship with. Um, and the idea was you would just seal a man in there and he would just like go for days until he found something to hit. And the best way to do that was they gave him speed balls, like this mix of methamphetamine and opium um, on like basically meth and oxy. He was just like taking meth and oxy trapped inside a metal coffin underwater, like trying to find on something to blow days. himself up into. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> So as the war in Russia bogged down and turned into a nightmare, Hitler's physical health began to degrade rapidly. This may have had something to do with his living conditions. For most of the war, Hitler cloistered himself away in a dank, mosquito-filled complex in eastern Prussia, known as the Wolf's Lair. And basically, everyone who isn't Hitler fucking hates it here. Um, like, it, it's, a, it's a miserable place. Um, it's uh, cramped. It's, it's basically these like tomb-like bunkers because so they can't get bombed. They're like windowless. The area around it is like filled with mosquitoes. You're in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's just like everyone but Hitler pretty much hates it. Hitler, though, has grown increasingly paranoid and irrational, and so he likes the isolation. He likes being surrounded by these like thick walls of concrete and like... Um, and this really worries the people close to him. During this time, Joseph Goebbels wrote... Tragic that the Fuhrer is closing himself off from life like this and leading such a disproportionately unhealthy existence. He no longer gets any fresh air. He doesn't take any kind of relaxation. He just sits in his bunker. Poor Goebbels. He doesn't even like the same music. He doesn't even like the same music. <laughs> oh, we haven't even I hung out Swan in Lake like and he months, barely man. even wanted to watch. <laughs> <laughs> One of the few people who had constant access to the Fuhrer was Theodore Morell. Through the war, he would inject more than 80 different substances mixed together in dozens of different concoctions. Again, it's impossible to say how much of Hitler's growing irrationality was due to the wild mix of hormones and drugs Morell pumped into him, but Hitler's generals noticed a difference in his behavior. In mid-1942, Field Marshal Erich von Manstein tried to convince Hitler to alter his plans in the southeastern front, where the dictator had diverted crucial forces from the main battlefield. As the Russians threatened to break through, critical decisions needed to be made, and Hitler was the guy to make them because he'd made himself commander-in-chief of the military. Manstein wrote, quote, 
As before, no full decisions are being made. It is as if the Fuhrer is not capable of it. Norman Oler suspects that Hitler's issue here stemmed in part from the wild change in his life the war brought. Prior to the invasions, Hitler addressed his people constantly. He was in some ways a drug for the German people, because being in a crowd like that, being hyped up, look at the Trump rallies, right? It is a drug going to that, having that kind of experience. For the people who do it, they get addicted to it. And the person, the demagogue, gets addicted to it. Hitler was very much addicted to the adulation of crowds. It affects your brain in a way that is psychochemically powerful. But when the war and the bombing started, Hitler had to stop putting himself in front of his people. And so he suddenly loses access to this thing that he's really psychologically addicted to. From Blitzed, Hitler now missed those ecstasies that his appearances had previously prompted, and which had always amounted to a new injection of the pepped-up feeling that was so important to his self-esteem. In his isolation, all pleasure and energy previously received from the attention of a cheering crowd had to be replaced by chemicals, further cocooning the dictator. He was the person who eventually needed artificial charging. In a sense, Morel's drugs and medicines replaced the old stimulus of mass ovations. This sounds like when like, a child actor doesn't become an actor and then it's yeah. sad. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. yeah. Hitler, Hitler's having what we might call the Macaulay Culkin effect. There's a lot oh, of similarities oh, between them. Like <laughs> I know, I'm joking. I'm being mean to Macaulay Culkin, who gave my friend a lap dance once. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, on his birthday. It was very nice. Um, Love that. Yeah, I've I've actually, he seems to be a very nice guy. Um, Very little in common with Hitler, other than that they were both child stars, you know? (laughs) And in fact, Hitler's original version of Home Alone, some would say is even superior, but... I mean, this is Hitler Home Alone in his bunker, (laughs) not talking to Goebbels. Um, In late 1942, (laughs) the Russians broke through around Stalingrad, encircling the German 6th Army. Hitler refused to allow them to break out and retreat, as that would mean ending the siege of the city. Um, he basically was like, if you guys really were not, really like me, you'll 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 find a way to win somehow. Goering promised him that the Luftwaffe could would be able to keep hundreds of thousands of men supplied by the air, which was a ridiculous promise. The U.S. does manage something like this in Berlin after the war, the Berlin Airlift, where like there's this kind of conflict with the USSR. And so like the chunk of Berlin we have is kind of cut off. We can't refuel it by car and they have to like drop in supplies. Um, but it's just with, with kind of the, the, the planes that the Luftwaffe has, um, with the technology they have, there's just no way to do it. Um, but Hitler believed Goering, um, and wound up learning that Goering was just a piece of shit and a liar, um, which... Surprise, they all were. Um, So by December 9th, it had become clear that Goering had no ability to keep the 6th Army supplied. Hitler was very angry at this. Um, And Morell noted that day that his his patient suffered from intestinal gases, halitosis, and discomfort. By early 1943, the war was decidedly not fun anymore, and the bad news increasingly outnumbered the good. Hitler asked his physician if he might try a new medication, cardiazole, which Goering had advised him to try for anxiety. Since Hitler had heart problems, Morell thought this was a bad idea. It was a blood thinner, I think. But Oler writes, he understood this as a call to action. Hitler needed something stronger to calm his nerves. The eventual drug he picked was an opiate called Eucadol, which is basically oxy. Right? Like, Eucadol is kind of the same thing as oxygen, but close enough for government work. He first dosed Hitler with it on July 18th, 1943. Germany had just sent the best of its elite troops and tank forces into a massive battle with the Russians at a place called Kursk. The battle ended with Russian victory and over a million estimated casualties. It marked the last significant offensive the Germans would make in the East. Like, yeah, a single battle um, where there are more casualties than in the U.S. Civil War. Like... Uh, Kursk is, is, is a nightmare. This and it's is like, insane. Yeah, 800,000 Russian, 200,000 or so German. And this is the last, this is kind of like when the German army stops being capable of offensives in the East is Kursk. So obviously, not a good day for Hitler. He's kind of bummed out about this, right? His favorite toy is broken. He's going to have to shoot himself in a bunker. You know, we've all been there in our own ways. I wonder what Goebbels' diary entry was that day. Hitler's sad, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hitler's like really upset mm-hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's oh, he is so bummed out. He's kind of bringing us all down just because he got a million men killed for nothing. Well, killed and wounded. Hitler was devastated by the defeat and his normal mix of hormones, steroids, speed and vitamins was not enough from Blitzed. 
Hitler saw all his hopes going up in smoke, and because of the imminent betrayal of the Italian army, who were about to surrender, he had not slept a wink, as Morel wrote. Body tensed hard as a board, full of gases, very pale appearance, extremely nervous. Tomorrow, very important discussion with Il Duce. That's Mussolini. In the middle of the night, Morel was dragged from his bed by Heinz Ling, Hitler's valet. The Fuhrer was bent double with pain, and an immediate cure was required. The white cheese he had had for dinner, as well as the roulade with spinach and peas, had disagreed with him. Morel gave him an injection, but the basic medical treatment didn't work. The doctor wondered feverishly what needed to be done to combat the great attack in this precarious situation. He needed something that worked, something that would numb Hitler's severe pain and keep him functioning. He needed an ace up his sleeve. And in fact, he did have something, but its use was risky. For the second quarter of 1943, in the bottom right corner of the file card, Patient A, a substance is listed and underlined several times. Eukadol. This is the point at which he starts giving Hitler oxy. Hitler gets, Hitler gets like, you know, small town America addicted at this point. Um, and as you might guess from what happened to small town America when oxy went rampant, it does not have a positive impact on Hitler. It's not really good for anyone. Avoid being addicted to OxyContin would be my advice, if you're considering it. If you're on the line right now being like, should I get addicted to Oxy? No. We, are, we have a small opinion, but ours is no. Is no, no as well. No Oxy. Yeah, stick with meth. Healthy methamphetamine. Okay, so the Eukadol had a massive and immediate positive impact on Hitler. His mood improved, he grew optimistic, elated even, and he became much easier to work with. People around him were like, wow, Hitler's a lot more pleasant when he's doped up. <laughs> I mean, and if I- like throwing a yeah. party. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I had to hang out with Hitler every day, you would want him to be high, right? You don't want to deal with sober Hitler or Hitler coming down, like Jesus. You're like, give um, him anything. Go to the yeah, farm. Literally find give him some anything. Animal, just yeah. Don't shoot him. With anything. Grab some from a pig. Put it in him. Exactly. Let's <laughs> yeah. try it. Yeah. What other animals we got? Find a monkey. See if monkey stuff works in him. <laughs> um, so Morel kept injecting the leader. Sometimes he would mix stimulants earlier in the day with opiates later in the day to calm him down. And from this point forward, Hitler was more or less constantly on something, generally Eukadol every other day, and particularly during key moments of decision. In his last meeting with Mussolini, a U.S. Secret Service report noted that Hitler spoke for three hours without a break. Um... So, Oler writes, quote, Mussolini had actually planned to convince Hitler that it would be better for everyone if Italy came out of the war, but all he did was knead his painful back from time to time, dab his forehead with a handkerchief, or sigh deeply. The door kept opening to pass on new reports about the bombing of Rome, which was happening at that very moment. Mussolini couldn't even comment on this because Hitler was talking nonstop to a room full of painfully embarrassed people about how no one should doubt the imminent victory of the Axis powers. The dejected Duce was effectively talked into the ground by the artificially pepped up Fuhrer. The result of the meeting, Italy would stick at it for the time being. Morel felt vindicated. He seemed to have maneuvered high-level politics with his injections, and he noted self-importantly, Fuhrer fit and well. No complaints whatsoever on the return flight. Fuhrer declared in the Obersalzburg in the evening that the success of the day was to my credit. So Hitler's just fucking racked and spun and talks for three hours, won't even let Mussolini say anything. And essentially, like, Mussolini's too, like, awkward. Especially awkward. <laughs> yeah, to, 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 to try to pull out of the war at this juncture. So that's cool. Fun stuff. I mean, we've all hung out with the guy who was that kind of high at a party, right? Yeah, and we've always... we've all stayed in a world war at one point mm -hmm. knowing oh it my for God. our benefit i um, know i because know we were like i just didn't know what to say mm -hmm. yeah i wanted to pull my forces out of the war before the allies invaded but right. like it's a tale as old as time party you're like mm -hmm. i don't want you to see me leave mm -hmm. and you feel like i left too yeah. early <laughs> hard to irish goodbye from a war <laughs> exactly exactly uh good shit um so, while he was shooting a constant stream of narcotics and animal extracts into the veins of the mightiest warlord in history, Theodore Morel was also running an increasingly elaborate side hustle. Hitler needed him so constantly that he could not run his own private practice, but his connection to the leader allowed him to steal a shitload of stuff. He was given one of the largest cooking oil manufacturers in Czechoslovakia, which had been stolen from its Jewish owners. He used the factory to produce an anti-louse powder of his own invention, which did not work but was mandatory for the Wehrmacht. Because again, dude's connected. 
His big, setter, sell, his big seller was Vita Molten Bars. These were an edible version of the vitamin shots he distributed so freely. Morel also increasingly experimented with hormones derived from animal organs. When Ukraine was conquered by the Nazis, he used his con connections to take possession of several slaughterhouses worth of fresh animal organs and diverted scant Wehrmacht resources to ferrying these organs to his factories so that they could be turned into experimental hormone medications. Now, by 1943, the Reich Health Office had instituted a ban on introducing new medicine into the German market. This threatened Morell's business, but he found a way to get around it. Since Hitler was at this point deeply reliant on the doctor, Morell was allowed to experiment on Hitler with different extractions and injections. He argued successfully that if his drugs were safe for Hitler, they must be safe for the German people. Morell wrote this to the Reich Health Office. The Fuhrer has authorized me to do the following. If I bring out and test a remedy and then apply it in the Fuhrer's headquarters and apply it successfully, then it can be applied elsewhere in Germany and no longer needs authorization. It's a good uh, uh, ad slogan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If it's good for the fur. It's if it's like, good for the Fuhrer, why can't you yeah. take it? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Um, as the war turned, other Nazis dealt with more anxiety over their imminent doom. Morell began handing out his medications to the people closest to Hitler, including Eva Braun. She noticed the impact Morell's drugs had on her partner's mood, and she wanted the same stuff. And Oler suggests this is because, like, she wanted to she wanted to fuck. She wanted to be intimate with her with her romantic partner, and he was racked as hell all the time. She was like, "Well, if we're going to be intimate, I need to be on whatever he's on, right?" Like, we need to be on the same thing, otherwise it's, it's, it's going to be impossible to connect, which I guess is understandable. Um, and yeah. But it's not ecstasy. It's like no testicle. Yeah, it's, 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 well, we'll talk about what it is. So Hitler was injected with testosterone for his libido, and Brown was given medication to suppress her menstruation. They were both given regular injected speedballs, mixes of uppers and downers by Morel, so that they would be in the same headspace and stuff. Just give them the best chance of being able to bone. Now, from his first Eucadol injection in 1943 to the end of 1944, Morell had noted administering Eucadol at least 24 times. Oler suggests the real number was much higher. And just as with his meth, Morell didn't always write out what he was giving the Fury. It was sometimes just like an injection that included some of the, you know, you wouldn't know exactly what was in it. It would be fair to critique Oler for speculation here, but when you take in the sheer quantity of injections Morell gave Hitler and the variety of substances that flowed through his brain and the reports of people around him, I don't think he's unreasonable in suggesting Hitler was taking, and, and we, we, you know, there's other evidence to suggest he, he was taking a lot of Eucadol. Um, so he makes his case in part by noting reports from those close to Hitler about the severity of his mood swings on critical days. And this is probably most notable with D-Day, which is obviously a pretty important day for a Hitler. Quote, Hitler's mood on D-Day, another nail in the coffin for the Nazi state, was subject to severe fluctuations. At nine in the morning, he is said to have bellowed across the breakfast room, is this the invasion or isn't it? When Morell hurried over and gave him an injection of X, he calmed down, suddenly appeared affable and lighthearted, enjoyed the day and the fine weather, and clapped everyone he met jovially on the shoulder. At the midday- It's D-Day! It's D-Day! It's D-Day! D-Day! Yeah. At the midday briefing, in spite of the looming military disaster, to everyone's astonishment, he revealed a beaming face. And at the lunch that followed, Seminola dumpling soup, mushrooms in a ring of rice, apple strudel, he fell into one of his endless distracted monologues. This time it was about elephants, which were the strongest animals in existence, and which, like him, abhorred meat. Next, Hitler described in detail the horrors of a slaughterhouse he visited in occupied Poland. Girls in rubber boots had waded in blood up to their ankles. Meanwhile, Morel was preparing his next injection, made from the glands of slaughtered animals <laughs> i can't believe that hitler's literally like reciting from jonathan saffron foer's eating animals and yeah. like <laughs> at the same time um, dude you know how strong elephants are they don't eat meat they're just like me i'm like an elephant <laughs> Oh it is a great God. coke rant, or I guess oxy. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, oxy and probably methamphetamine. Like he's getting a, a bit of bit of a bit of b. Um, yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, it's pretty funny, uh, and also that he's ranting about how horrible the meat industry is while being shot up with animal hormones that have been, yeah, the product of that industry. Um, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Of course, Hitler had always suffered from bizarre mood swings and from delusions, but Oler is right that people close to Fuhrer noted his mental degradation. And again, I don't think it's unreasonable to suggest that the constant doses of hormones and narcotics shot into a 50-something-year-old man sped up this process. 
Late in the war, a Nazi named Klaus von Stauffenberg tried to kill Hitler with a briefcase bomb. It didn't take, but it did blow out both of Hitler's eardrums. An ear, nose, and throat specialist was brought in, Dr. Erwin Geising, and he was immediately horrified at the Fuhrer's health. And from Geising, we get our really interesting descriptions of Hitler in this period of time. Quote, the face was pale, slightly swollen, and there were large bags under both bloodshot eyes. The eyes did not make the fascinating impression so often ascribed to them in the press. I was particularly struck by the wrinkles from either side of the nose to the outer corner of the mouth, and by the dry, slightly cracked lips. His hair was already clearly mixed with gray and rather unkempt. The face was well shaven, but with, but with somewhat withered skin, which I attribute to fatigue. The speech was unnaturally loud and tended towards a shout, and later became somewhat hoarse an aged, almost depleted and exhausted man who had to make do with what was left of his strength. I know, poor Hitler. Oh, no. Gerbils is like... <laughs> Crying, in yeah. Listening to the cure. He looks like shit. Yeah. <laughs> Hitler was clearly an ill man, and when he met Morell, when Dr. Giesing met Morell and started to learn what was being given to the leader, he was furious. And it's also from Giesing that we get some of our best information on how the doctor conducted himself during this time. So this is Giesing writing about Morell giving Hitler his treatment. Quote, Morell comes in, distinctly short of breath and panting. He shakes only Hitler's hand and asks, a asks agitatedly whether anything in particular happened during the night. Hitler says no. He slept well, and even digested the previous night's salad without any difficulty. Then, with the help of Ling, he takes off his coat, sits back in his armchair, and pulls up his left sleeve. Morell gives Hitler the injections. He pulls the needle out again and wipes the puncture site with a handkerchief. Then he leaves the room and goes into the office, holding in his right hand the used syringe, and in the left empty ampules, one large and two small. He goes with the ampules and a syringe into the adjacent orderly's bathroom, rinses the syringe out himself, and destroys the empty ampules by throwing them in the toilet. Then he washes his hands, comes back into the office, and says goodbye to everyone present. So that's Hitler Steeler right there. Just heading out. Just heading out. And also, like, in flushing everything to make sure people can't, like, check it out, analyze it, see what's in it, you know? Some of that's probably yeah. because this is how he makes his money, you know, keeping like, you know, he's running a business. He's selling versions of this stuff. Some of it's probably because he doesn't want Hitler's other doctors to know what the fuck Hitler's being given. Stuff like is the fact funky. that he's, yeah. yeah, the stuff that I've been doping up our leader, you know. Funky milk. Yeah. And the two doctors quickly came to hate each other, um, obviously. One of them, I mean, they're, we'll talk about it. They're both a little bit sketchy, but Morell is obviously much sketchier. Um, Dr. Giesing, though, was not straight edge either. His preferred treatment for ear, nose, and throat medic stuff was cocaine. And so, after this point, he administered coke to Hitler in the form of nose and throat dabs. This more is than what you've been missing. Uh-huh. This is what you've been missing. You just needed a little bit of coke. That'll get your Hitler going. That'll Hitler you right on up, buddy. Um, and so, after this point, he administered cocaine to Hitler uh, more than 50 times over the next 75 days. He used an extremely strong 10% solution and absolutely got the German leader high as fuck. In fact, Hitler was noted by his doctor as having, quote, slight cocaine sniff during this period. So, he's got the drip. He's like, he's, he's, just, he's got the slight coke sniff going sniff. on. Yeah. He quickly took it for more than just ear problems, telling Giesing after one dose, my mind is freed again, and I feel very well. Then adding, please don't turn me into a cocaine addict. Giesing assured him that real addicts snorted cocaine. Can't be an addict if you're dropping it into your fucking eye, bro. That's what I See, said. that's how you, that's what keeps you from being addicted. You just drop it into your fucking eye. You don't be snorting it like an addict. That's gross. I was like, you guys, please don't. If, if you think this is a problem of I'm like being an asshole, just tell me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> just be honest. Yeah, if you think I'm honest. out of control. You think I'm out of control? Do you think I'm doing too much coke, my coke dealer? No, nah, bro, be you're honest. good. You're beautiful, bro. <laughs> um yeah. Now, Giesing was, though, a better doctor than Morell, and he eventually grew unsettled by the fact that he was essentially now the coke dealer if the absolute ruler of his country. He tried to cut off Hitler's supply, and this did not go over well. Hitler was being like, I've got an important meeting. I can't function because my ears hurt so bad. You have to give me a shitload of cocaine. Um, and he was like, no, I'm not going to give you any more coke. Um, Hitler said, quote, no doctor, continue as before. This morning I have a terrible throbbing head that probably comes from the sniffing. Concern for the future and the continued existence of Germany are consuming me more and more with each passing day. I need the coke, man. I'm just so worried about Germany. 
I'm doing coke because I love Germany. I'm doing coke for my love of the fatherland. Like it's just about the, the fatherland, you know, classic cokehead excuse. Um, so Giesing, <laughs> Giesing refused though, like said like, no, I'm not going to give you any more fucking cocaine and petulant Hitler refused to show up to his military briefings that day and deal with the fact that his army was collapsing. If you don't give me Coke, I'm not going to make sure the, I'm not going to give the army orders. Like <laughs> fucking Hitler. I'm not going to put on pants <laughs> if I don't have Coke. Yeah. So Giesing eventually was convinced to relent. I think the generals were like, dude, we can't give orders without him like we're not allowed to you have to you have to do something you have to give him his fucking coke um and so uh he relented and he gave hitler some cocaine to save the german army but he demanded that if he was going to give hitler the coke he had to give hitler had to allow him to give the fuhrer a full medical checkout a checkup, which Giesing did and eventually came to suspect that the anti-farting pills Morell had prescribed Hitler were causing some of the Fuhrer's health problems. He attempted to use this to force the physician out of Hitler's inner circle and perhaps even have him prosecuted. And there were a lot of folks close to Hitler who were worried about Morell, who were like, this guy is doping the leader up. It's not good for Hitler. Like, we got to get this guy out of here, but Hitler likes him too much. Um, and they kind of tried to back this effort to force Morell out. But it just didn't work. As Hitler's first and best drug dealer, Morell was just dug in too tight. As the Red Army closed in at the end of 1944, uh, Hitler and Morell had both retreated into a bunker under Berlin. Hitler, by this point, was jaundiced as his liver had started to fail and his Parkinson's was advanced enough that he shook constantly. Morell had to cancel several injections because the Fuhrer's veins had collapsed, right? That's like Holy advanced... Shit smack addict stuff that like yeah. your your veins aren't working anymore it, it was reported that like when he when he would get an injection it would crunch like his veins were crunchy Holy like it's, moly. he was a an advanced addict um at this stage um so yeah still though morell continued to shoot hitler full of opium and hormones as often as possible it is probable that these opiates contributed to quite a lot to Hitler's GI issues. They can cause constipation, and Hitler was using so frequently that he had significant issues with this. Morell's notes state that the German leader had regular painful wind. As his body fell apart, his guards in the bunker wrote entries like this about Hitler's bodily functions. Quote, from four, to, from four until six, four evacuations, two of which were weaker and two very strong. At the second, after the passing of an obstruction, explosive water evacuation. The third and fourth were very foul-smelling, and particularly the fourth, probably a decomposing agglomeration that had previously been left behind and had become a cause of gases in the formation of toxic substances, regularly improved condition and change of facial expression. He only card called me to impart the, ha the happy news of this effect." Which is one of the undertold stories of the the last Nazis around Hitler as the Third Reich collapsed. We're just like You're standing disgusting. there, like <laughs> listening to him shit his guts out, like recording how bad it smelled. Which is, I love that for Nazis, actually. It's kind of poetic, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I love that for them. As the Red Army closed in, Morell finally lost his ability to provide his boss with the drugs he, by this point, badly needed. Again, like, there just was no ability to get more of them, right? Germany's industrial base had fucking collapsed. Um, and when Morell ran out of drugs, he, he and Hitler had a falling out. Hitler suddenly, like, starts threatening to have him executed. And, like, it's like, again, as soon as he can't get the dope, Morell is out on his ass. This and he, makes sense. This adds yeah, up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he wasn't a friend. Yeah, he's he's forced out of Berlin, the bunker, and he, he successfully is like one of the last people to flee Berlin. He does get captured by the Allies. He's questioned and turned for more than a year, and he dies soon after the war, impoverished and miserable. And of course, we all know how Hitler died. So. How? I'm just kidding. Good story. Having a good time? It's good stuff. It kind of is like a Marvel movie. Like how <laughs> I would. Die in a Marvel movie. Meets I would. Ugh. Yeah. That indie movie that came out where Paul Dano and Daniel Radcliffe are dealing with a farting corpse on a beach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like the marriage of those two. Yeah. I mean, that would be uh, that'd be a great Daniel Radcliffe could be Hitler. Um, Paul Rudd could be Theodore Morell. Sure. Uh, James Gunn could direct. Um, yeah, let's do it. Throw Iron Man in there, too, for some reason. Why not? Why not? <laughs> Why not? All right. Well, Carolina, how are you feeling? I am feeling like the public and private school system failed me by not addressing these issues. Mm -hmm. um, 
and not telling me these corners of history. And also, I am feeling uh, drug-free. I'm feeling inspired to stay drug-free for a while. And when I say mm-hmm. drug-free, I'm not just the normie stuff, but I feel like not smoking meth is... At this point, an accomplishment. Mm-hmm. Yes, and don't, don't, don't do meth. We were just. I don't joking. think it would make me into a Nazi. Don't do meth. But you know, mm-hmm. it's it does no. You don't no. want to get too much in the Venn diagram with their behavior, and even yeah. just meth being one thing that they did, it makes it all the less appealing. You will not become a Nazi because you smoke meth. But, but if you're a Nazi and you smoke meth, you'll become more of a Nazi. Yeah, as a general rule, if you start taking a shitload of meth, the things about you that are already that not suck. great, <laughs> like everybody has things about them that suck. And one of the downsides of a drug like meth is that it it makes everything about you bigger and more so. And so the meth will, whatever you don't like about yourself, the meth will make be more of a thing about yourself. And perhaps that's not something you want. And this was brought to you by Nancy Reagan's Drug Free America. Mm-hmm. Yes, and the council for... Maybe try Oxy instead, the drug with no consequences, OxyContin. Don't look at the Midwest. Also, also, no. (sighs) Uh, Good stuff. Well, Carolina, you got any pluggables to plug? I am going to plug my amazing podcast, True Romance. It is released every Thursday. We talk about dating crises, your dating nightmares, horrific breakups, and really good love stories. So you can find it on... Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, wherever you listen to podcasts. And it's True Romance with Carolina Barlow and Devin Leary. Mm-hmm. Woo. Yep. Burr. Thank you so much for having me on Behind the Bastards. This was the coolest podcast I've ever been able to be on. Uh, well, thank you so much for coming along, Carolina, and talking to, with me about Hitler and meth and Hitler's horrible farts. It's it's just all been a, a magical joy. story. It was a joy. A magical, magical story. All right. Well, that's going to do it for us here at Behind the Bastards and only Behind the Bastards, the only podcast either Sophie or I are involved with. I hate you most of the time. All right. Follow follow at Cool Zone Media for all the podcasts we actually do. That's the end of the podcast. <laughs>